And welcome once again to Father's Spitzer's Universe, where faith and reason intersect every week here. I'm Doug Keck, the gatekeeper, coming to you from Mother Angelica Way, where Mother started it all back in 1981 in Irondale, Alabama, and continues to reach the world. Great vision of Mother Angelica, and we appreciate your support. You know, you can email your questions to us at spitzersuniverse at ew10.com. That's a great way to support this show because we use them in every week. And check out Father Spitzer's websites, Magis Center, Credible Catholic, Purposeful Universe as well. A myriad of sites for a myriad of occasions, depending on what you're looking for. There's also Father Spitzer's Universe available as a podcast on EWTN's Podcast Central. Check that out. You can go to EWTN.com forward slash radio. Click on podcasts. You can listen to Mother Angelica, Father Spitzer, all your other favorite programs when you want to, anytime you want to. It's all free on EWTN Podcast Central. And vanity is what we're talking about here. That's the topic for the uh, particular program. That's not why we promoted Father's and Mine uh, podcast. Uh, but uh, it would be good for you if, if you could listen to it as well. But vanity is our topic for Christ versus Satan in our daily lives, available naturally through a religious catalog. I assume you have it already because you've got to get ready for Father's next book, which is out, and we've got a bookmark coming up on that. But the book of the month for November, coming from EWTN Publishing, Women Made New, Reflections on Adversity, Transformation, and Healing by Kristalina Everett, of course. And you know her from her series here on EW10, an ongoing podcast and radio show. Now we turn to Father Spitzer, a man of many talents, and ask him to uh, welcome us and to kick things off with a prayer, if you will, Father. You bet. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your many blessings to us, the blessing especially of this ministry and our ability to serve within it. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit down upon us today, Doug, myself, our whole audience, so that everything we do and say in here will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. Through Jesus our Lord, amen. amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray amen. for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And uh, uh, a slightly early but happy Thanksgiving, Father, to, to you. Oh, thank you so and much. Your, and to your family. So, uh, Looking are, forward to it. Are you going to see your, do you go up and see your sister for Thanksgiving or are you local or what are you yes, doing? Yes, uh, that's exactly what I'm going to do and okay. it'll be a, a whole lot of fun and uh, of course I uh, can't quite go up there as we're, uh, you know, on the program but I'll be up right. there pretty soon so uh, it'll be great and uh, of course I have a good time with them and I may even go to a Gonzaga basketball game oh. where my nephew-in-law will of course explain the play-by-play -play to me and oh, is that uh, what he does? see oh. what happens. Oh, that's great. Uh, yes he does. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> You're very good at it. That's too. right you can you can zig with the zags up there right? Okay. So that's there right. That's okay. right. My old uh, nephew-in-law <laughs> Ben there. <laughs> yeah, they 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 have a. Uh, you take uh, yeah, talking about vanity. I think you take a lot of credit for why the basketball team's so good, don't you? <laughs> Hardly. <laughs> oh no, I have to tell you, no one knows less than I do about basketball. But uh, God graced me with a good team, and right. uh, you know, gave me a, uh, two people who gave me very, very good advice about who I should pick as the head coach. And okay. wow, what a great decision that was. Awesome. Of course, uh, I, I made the, the decision in name. They were the ones that uh, said you'd be crazy not to do this. So, mm. uh, in any case, it was uh, it was very good. And of course, Mark uh, Few has been a super coach right. uh, uh, since the day he was brought on as head coach. And hired so many incredible staff people, put together so many right. fantastic teams. Uh, you know, it was a no question. Prof it's prophetic a decision on your part, of course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it certainly wasn't no. an informed athletic one that came from within me. It was an informed athletic one that came from elsewhere. <laughs> there you go. Okay. You're just being overly <laughs> humble, Father. So let's talk oh, no. about uh, <laughs> oh, no. some of the some of the <laughs> the topics out here. We've got uh, this is an issue. Obviously, we just went through the uh, the red wave, the abortion red wave, unfortunately, which we kind of talked about last week a little bit. But also, what's out there is uh, an article, and I know you've you've mentioned this on earlier programs 
who could have guessed dangerous chemical abortion pills are being handed out despite regulations this was uh -huh. actually came from town hall and they say last December the Biden administration's FDA relaxed safety regulations allowed for dangerous chemical abortion pills to be made available online and by mail without an in-person visit this despite how data shows such a method was much more dangerous than surgical abortions. It also revealed that the FDA relied on incomplete data when making the decision. Gee, I wonder why they pushed that through. Well, no, I mean, it was clearly political, but it's uh, the same thing with the transgender issue we discussed last week. I mean, it, it's being pushed through because of the political agenda, mm -hmm. it, you know, regardless of, of the effects that it's going to have uh, on the um, on the, the victims, of course, if these things are taken and it induces, you know, uh, uh, you know, some kind of a terrible uh, physical state, and there are many of them that could occur, uh, you know, uh, uh, you, you really jeopardize the health of, of the woman. But in order to make uh, abortion, uh, uh, as it were, the most sacrosanct right in this country, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, the political agenda has determined that it's okay. And of course, you know how much that has uh, an effect on the FDA. So, uh, you know, all I can tell you is, hmm, I wonder how objective our, uh, uh, you know, these decisions are that are right. being made, especially with uh, very incomplete data that seems to have been the basis for this uh, new uh, move. But um, uh -huh. anyway, I, I won't be cynical anymore. I, there you go. Uh, you know, we just have to keep educating, 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 and uh, helping uh, when people begin to feel the emptiness, loneliness, alienation, and dread uh, right. that they are going to, uh, uh, you know, we can at least uh, give them another place where they can go to, namely the Lord God, uh, for uh, the comfort that he intended to give us through his good uh, right. moral commands. and. Uh, through the good life that he has prescribed for us. Right. Unfortunately, it, it doesn't seem like the only decision that the FDA may have made in conjunction with other <laughs> medical groups that are questionable, at least in, in some ways, certainly. Another, uh, uh, Bill Donahue mm -hmm. uh, from the Catholic League uh, talked about the idea that in this coming around the election, shifting the terms of debate. And we talked a little bit about on the last week's show about young women relying a lot of times, single mothers relying on the state. Uh, and uh, there was a comment that originally had come out from uh, AOC, as they call her. Uh, it's so yeah. out of touch to imply that abortion isn't an economic issue. Few things impact one's finances more than a child. It appears she took, and this is from Bill Donahue, her talking points from Planned Parenthood, who had a action fund arm uh, Planned Parenthood issued something called the Quickie, which declared abortion is an economic issue. So that's how we're justifying child murder now. Oh yeah, no, I, I think um, uh, the economic basis, of course, is where uh, uh, all roads settle uh, in a country that has no ideals uh, or is losing rapidly. Mm -hmm. It does still have its ideals, but it's losing rapidly its ideals, uh, its religion, its principles, its morality. It's at least its uh, non-relativistic objective morality. As fast as we are, uh, you know, you can expect things to settle at the end of the day. Uh, back to the good old economic measure, and uh, you know when when you when it comes down to uh, you know children versus um, you know as as putting a strain on the budget, mm -hmm. uh, we, you know when people actually do a lot of budgetary analysis, you know the amount of money that we waste on entertainment, the amount of money uh, that that we waste on uh, on on just uh, sir, trying to prove ourselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, to be in the right, uh, you know, peer group, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to have the right Instagram profile. It's just mind-boggling how much we're willing to spend on that. But if you bring up a child in competition to something like that, I mean, a level three motive versus a level two motive, right? A contributive and, mm -hmm. and, and loving motive to bring an eternal soul in the world versus getting a lot of hits and level two ego comparative happiness. Why? I think I'll just go for the level two. I mean, uh, I, I actually heard a person say once, you know, uh, if it came down to a child or a Benz, I'll take the Benz. Yeah, that's... Uh, so, yeah, well, I hope the uh, Benz uh, I mean, is very comforting in their deathbed, uh, maybe. Yeah. Maybe they could drive yeah. it in and pull it right mm -hmm. alongside, or maybe you can bury it yeah, in it. Yeah, exactly. Know, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, nobody's oh, going to wow. be there. <laughs> you know, that's what you look yeah. for at the end of the days, right? 
Uh, nobody ever died yeah. saying, I wish I spent more time yeah. at work, you know? Yeah. Right? <laughs> Well, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, right. You know what I mean? There are some crazies like me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, Joan would probably testify to that, but that'll happen later. Uh, yes, she would. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> poor here's, great one. <laughs> there you go. Uh, another story that I thought was interesting Catholic Answers had uh, something on their website. Father Jerry mm -hmm. Pekorsky, who's uh, been around for a while and was very helpful, I know, to. Mother Angelica years ago, mm -hmm. he says, we used to laugh, and uh, it's about preaching about sin. He said, we used to laugh at a famous mm -hmm. story about Calvin Coolidge. After returning from Sunday services, his wife asked him about the preacher's sermon, Sin. Silent Cow replies, you know, and his wife says, well, what did he say mm -hmm. about it? He said, well, he was against it, uh, of course. But he, <laughs> he makes the point here, alas, mm -hmm. modern culture no longer allows us to oppose sin except for those politically correct yeah. transgressions such as being quote unquote judgmental, emitting too, many, too much carbon yeah. into the atmosphere, but do priests and others have a choice yeah. to remain faithful to Jesus? And he's really calling out the idea that people need to preach about the concept of yeah. sin. So, your thoughts? Well, I hate to impose shameless advertising <laughs> on a program like this, but uh, I just wrote away. a book called The, the Moral... <laughs> The Moral Wisdom of the Catholic Church, which responds uh, to at least a way you can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, you can talk about uh, the terrible detrimental effects of opposing the church's, um, you know, uh, norms on homosexual lifestyle or on, um, uh, you know, on transgenderism, abortion, etc. If you start looking at that, you look at what post-abortion syndrome does to people. You look at what a transgender surgery does to people. You look at what physician-assisted suicide does to people. I mean, it, the deleterious effects on emotional health, on relational health, and on spiritual health. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you know, people think pornography is a victim sin. Just please read this book. It's not a victimless sin. It's got terrible effects on emotional health in terms of producing depression in the long run. Terrible effects in spiritual health. I mean, there's a, a you know, an inverse, a direct inverse correlation, uh, you know, that where you can see almost, you know, um, that uh, an increase in pornography viewing leads not only to, you know, increases in depression, but actually increases, uh, I mean, decreases in, in, uh, in uh, religious practice. And, and uh, you can see also uh, that people, um, you know, the emotional intimacy level in, in their marriages just goes plummeting downwards uh, to the point that the divorce level uh, goes up by more than two times uh, when you reach a certain level of pornography viewing. So, I mean, you, you look at this and you go, this is terrible for relational and marital health. It's terrible for emotional health. It's terrible for spiritual health. It's the least victim, uh, victimless sin you can possibly think of. Yet, the, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, don't be a prude. It's just a bunch of pictures. Right. You know, we've heard it a million times. So the the, the point I'm trying to get to is, in every mm -hmm. single moral teaching, I put it out for 12 major issues. You know, from IVF to uh, in, in vitro fertilization, you know, to abortion, to, to homosexual lifestyle, mm -hmm. to, to pornography, uh, to uh, birth control, to um, transgenderism, you name it. I put it, you know, I just took the 12 issues where we're getting always, you know, bombarded with people criticizing us for our position, yet it's right in, in every way, and this is measured by secular norms by secular mm -hmm. studies and use religiously oriented studies a subject accusation of bias just took the whole thing put it out there depression levels anxiety levels uh, substance abuse levels panic disorder levels you violate the church's moral teaching you can expect it on a huge incremental basis we're not just talking a little percentage we're talking about doublings and triplings two times three times five times seven times you know with suicidal ideation in the case of transgender right. uh, you know transgender surgery 20 times uh, the level of suicides etc you just look at it it's horrible mm. and yet people are just blind to this right. so i just thought well i'm going to write about what the secular surveys are saying that nobody else wants to say because uh, I, I guess I, I need to get canceled again. So, you know, the, <laughs> the main thing is, is you know, I, uh, I, I don't know what else to tell you. I just think it's so 
unbelievable how the, the word on these subjects and, and the statistical studies, the good ones that have been mm -hmm. done, that prove the point again and again. Why aren't they out there? Uh, why doesn't anybody say anything? Mm -hmm. Why is it if I quote the statistics, all the secular surveys I'm using are wrong, uh, you know, and so forth and so on. There's some other interpretation that they have. Well, why didn't they say that when the study came out? I didn't do the study. Mm -hmm. I'm just quoting studies. You know, if you didn't like the Pew right. survey, you should have said something Absolutely. to them. You know, don't tell me. Well, so the the point right. is, you know, I, I guess you know my, yeah. my my point is, yeah, you, you can't preach against a, sin. Right, as an but, old uh, as I an, am. <laughs> I, I quoted once before an old boss of mine used to say. Let's not let facts get in the way of what we want to do here, you know? So, I mean, it's that same idea, you know, right. don't, this right. dissonance, you're telling me something I don't want to believe or I don't believe, and so I'm going to find a reason yeah. uh, to push it away yeah. and act like it has no value. That's where we end up with so much of the right. kind of Alinsky-like ad hominem attack. Well, you're just, yeah. uh, you know, like you said, a Puritan yeah. or a priest or some other thing that yeah, allows approved, you yeah. to be discount yeah. the information. One other yeah, article yeah, exactly. here I wanted to touch on. I thought this was really sweet. Uh, the only religious community in the world for sisters with Down syndrome, we talked about a little, alluded to that, you talked about it last week, yeah. but seeks American sisters. So there's actually a, an order. The Little Sisters Dis Disciples of the Lamb live in prayer in southern uh -huh. France. Uh, so they're looking for some yeah. new sisters. And uh, the mother... Uh, in 1985, a young woman with Down syndrome, Sister Veronica, met Mother Line, who was in charge of it. Veronica had already received her vocational training to become a nun, but had been turned away by several religious communities. Mother Line recognized Sister Veronica's call to become a nun. She said at the time, the church and religious communities did not understand how a person with Down syndrome could have a call from God to join religious life. But Mother Line, who had studied psychology and taught catechism for many years, saw that people she worked with who had Down syndrome were, quote unquote, very spiritually inclined. God bless her, right? So. Yeah, absolutely, and that's so true. Right. I mean, they are spiritually inclined, and they're a lot purer in motive than most of us. <laughs> right. I'll tell you, there, there's just, I mean, sometimes, you know, you, you, you know what's coming, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes when they're about to formulate something, mm -hmm. but there is a purity of intention. There is to a genuineness mm. about their prayer and their belief in God, a genuineness in their trying to follow uh, the Lord. It is really remarkable to see. There's a great movie out called mm. Dominic and Eugene. Mm -hmm. Just a wonderful movie. I, I don't want to ruin it for everybody, uh, but it, I, I believe it's Dominic who's the uh, the down boy uh, and the brother and the um, Eugene, I think, is the... Uh, is the brother who is in medical school and mm -hmm. a very talented, gifted person. But that's a great one. Mm -hmm. When I was at uh, Georgetown, we used to run a uh, university. We used to, for the students, we used to run an agape retreat, ag mm -hmm. agape retreat. Mm -hmm. And in this retreat, we would actually uh, have you know the students talk about their own experience of suffering mm -hmm. or uh, their own experience of you know family life. And oftentimes, it would come out that some of these Georgetown students uh, would have a down mm -hmm. brother or sister. And uh, they would attribute who they are right. in their heart and who they are in the vocation that they have in education at Georgetown to their little down brother or sister. Mm -hmm. it, is, it was almost, you know, almost you could almost count on it. Every other mm -hmm. uh, ag ag agape retreat we'd have these uh, these testimonies, and I just thought it was fantastic. And and she's right. She's absolutely right. I mean, there's, um, you know, it's delightful. Uh, to, to be around these kids. You know, if you go to L'Arche uh, or, you, you know, you mm. know, you can always, sometimes they have these dinners and things that they open up for people, uh, you know, who really may be seriously high on, on the, uh, uh, you know, autism scale or right. whatever, mm. you know, they, they come on, um, uh, you know, and, and you, maybe they'd have a, a you know, a, a, Zader, a Seder dinner or something, or they'd mm. have a, you know, um, a dinner for Thanksgiving, and they did open it up for uh, some guests to come. I, it was wonderful. Right. I mean, these kids are—they are wonderful. I know, of course, they have their moments, right. as all kids have their moments. Right. But uh, no question about it, uh, they there's a purity there of, of intention, and there is some a kind of a goodness there. Uh, amidst the mischief that can sometimes be there, but uh, a delight 
certainly, and a love that's extraordinarily genuine and a prayer that is genuine beyond belief. So, uh, you know, absolutely mm -hmm. correct. The idea of, you know, euthanizing these right. kids in the womb, you know, I mean, oh. Yeah, what was going on in Iceland, right? Certainly. I don't know if they could still be doing that. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, uh, uh, you, you just can't begin to, to think about it. But of course, I put that in my book, too. Mm -hmm. You know, selective euthanasia, you know, for. Uh, uh, in the womb, you know, right. and that's the new eugenics. You just do it in the womb. You don't do right. any kind of o overt Hitlerian kind of stuff, right. you know. <laughs> right. Just uh, you do it in the womb. And it's okay. It's right. hidden, you know. Uh, we nip, oh, oh, man. We nip it in the bud. Yeah. And that's what they do. They nip it in yes. the bud before it starts. Yes. yes Let's indeed. get to some, uh, move on yeah. to some questions from our, our viewers. Uh, first up, Dear Father Spitzer. Some Catholic nuns in our diocese are slowly switching to the position that abortion can be morally correct in some cases. How does a person of faith and supposed closeness to God come to such a conclusion? What are the consequences of their reaching that conclusion? Gina. Pure and utter deception. Mm. Self-deception, moral deception, deception about the word of Jesus Christ and what it means religious deception, spiritual deception, utter pure deception. That's the only way you can possibly justify it. I mean, I, I cannot believe that anyone would intentionally embrace something so intrinsically wrong, emotionally wrong, culturally wrong in every respect. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, so contrary to the notion of self-sacrificial love of Jesus Christ. Uh, I mean, I, there's, a, there's only one way. You know, that, that notion of compassion is, is utterly false. I, I remember one day I was debating a guy during the uh, physician-assisted suicide um, movement, and uh, this, this guy comes and he, and he basically says, well, Bob, uh, we, we both agree on the same thing. And I said, well, what's that, Ralph? He goes, well, love. We both agree on love. And I said, yeah, but it all depends on what you mean by love. And that's, you know, there's love one, love two, love three, and love four. And if you got a love two and a love one uh, view of love, uh, you're not going to agree with the love three and the love four people. Right. I mean, it's just that, that simple. And I mean, uh, I, I think it's, it's got to be deception about love, deception about faith, deception about what God's will is, deception about morality, deception about the good. Uh, that's the only way you could come to that, that, uh, that conclusion. And all I can say is stop it. Mm -hmm. Stop the intentional self-delusion. I mean, it's it's not worthy right. of you, and it's not worthy of the of the pro, the religious vocation you profess. Right, absolutely. Next up, another question, dear Father Spitzer, a close friend of mine is considering getting an abortion. We have discussed in the past that God is merciful and will forgive someone who has had an abortion. She feels alone yeah. and abandoned right now, and thinks the best thing to do is go through with the abortion and seek God's forgiveness afterward. How do I explain to her she has other options, Gloria? Well, Gloria, the first thing, of course, is you don't want to add culpability to the whole problem. In other words, <laughs> getting the abortion, you know, so that you can ask forgiveness later, mm -hmm. you know, the idea of just go ahead and it's easier to ask for forgiveness than for permission. Right. Right. The, the first thing is, is, you know, you really do want to bring the Lord into it now. So if she does have faith right now, the idea is bring the Lord into it right now. She, she, she feels alone. She feels like, you know, uh, no one really cares about it. She feels like she's going to be stuck, uh, quote unquote, with this child and so forth. I know what's going through her mind uh, in a way, and I know the desperation. She, I don't know it personally, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, the desperation she feels, but I can certainly imagine uh, what it would be like vicariously. So, I mean, I can surely say this to her, though. If you begin to pray about this and ask the Lord for what he thinks and what he wants, first of all, if you do not want that child when you give birth to that child, you can give that child up for uh, adoption. I can 
can tell you that child will be taken, snapped up, uh, appreciated, loved within a few minutes, uh, you know, of a healthy mm -hmm. delivery. The adoption lists are so long. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody's desperate to have a, a child, you know, a beloved little child that they can raise that they can't have for themselves. So the first thing is, is okay, is it worth it, you know, to to have to sort of slip away from, uh, you know, uh, uh, the societal contact for a little while, uh, while you go through the last months of a pregnancy and then give life to this child. If, mm -hmm. if that's what the problem is, is if it's, you know, people recognizing, uh, you know, that there's a child out of wedlock, uh, but I'm not even sure if it was out of wedlock, you mm -hmm. know, if that child was out of wedlock, maybe, maybe not. But whatever the case is, it's always worth it to, 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 to make the sacrifice for life. At the end of the day, you will never regret it. At the end of the day, you won't go through the post-abortion syndrome. Look at those statistics from mm -hmm. Priscilla Coleman. In fact, that's one thing to just inform her about. There's a wonder, on the Cambridge University website, there's a wonderful study that was done by uh, um, Dr. Pr uh, Priscilla Coleman um, for the uh, British Journal of Psychiatry. And if you look, just uh, put in uh, abortion, uh, post-abortion syndrome, Coleman, Cambridge, and you'll get the the whole um, uh, 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 you know survey that she did. Mm -hmm. It involved three quarters of a million women. Wow. So this is a really good survey. And just take a look. The odds of her having uh, emotional and psychological problems um, after the abortion, by comparison to not getting one are 81 percent higher if she gets the abortion on the whole. You can expect a four times increase in suicides, 2.5 times increase in suicidal ideation. Absolutely, mm -hmm. this is a very, very good survey. Uh, you know, take a look at that, just uh, Priscilla Coleman, mm -hmm. post-abortion syndrome on the Cambridge website. That's one thing I think I would recommend uh, um, uh, very much mm -hmm. uh, as well so she can see what the consequences are to her but more than that as that little child grows up I can tell you this right now as you can imagine the love she will be enjoying with mm -hmm. these new parents and there are so many they're just really really thousands of parents thousands tens of thousands mm -hmm. of parents who want a child who can't get a child who would love to have a baby born in the, in the US and have that baby right away when the, the baby's very young and so forth uh, I mean it's it's you know I'm begging you uh, you know the idea the, the responsible thing to do is you know okay I know that last three months is is uh, or four months you know can be you know right. terrible mm -hmm. but there are ways of coping and I would just go down to a birthright center or to another um, uh, one of the clinics that will help you um, you know to um, uh, you know uh, uh, to get this um, uh, you know the, the help you need right, the to find out how you, need, you can uh, right, deal yeah. with the situation mm -hmm. right, exactly. exactly right yeah right. and Obria by the way is also very good uh, just go to an Obria center they're they're all over the US all over and in the big cities there's two or three of them so just uh, you, you might want to just go to an Obria center get a counselor get the resources that you need mm -hmm. and and oftentimes they do supply resources they tell you how to cope uh, you know with the last uh, three months and, and so forth and so on they and not only that but uh, you know how to uh, basically um, you know put a child mm -hmm. up for adoption if that's what you want to do or if you want to take the child yourself how to do that even though uh, you are uh, by yourself and so forth. So there's all kinds of things, but go to an Obria Center. That's what I counsel her to do at the end, but also show her that Pris Priscilla Coleman uh, survey uh, or, you know, a birthright or, you know, uh, birth choice or any one of the, the, mm -hmm. the clinics uh, that are there that can right. help you. And, and so much of the time, we, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, you know, you look at the founder of Apple, he was a doc. Uh, basically uh, 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 adopted. Certainly yeah. Aaron Judge, who broke the mm -hmm. American League home run record, was adopted. There's so many people yeah. out there. You yeah. find out who were adopted, who yeah. if they weren't, you know, allowed to be born, yeah. you know, some of these great achievements. Yeah. And then we always said, how many great achievements haven't happened because of all the abortions, right? 
Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, uh, beyond achievements, how much love mm -hmm. was not experienced, right. uh, you know, because, you know, well, th th these, these children are so lovable that at the end of the day, you know, you're going to get far more from that child right. than, that, uh, than you're going to give to that child in terms of the love, the delight, the, the dependence, the, and, and, you know, as they grow older, they mm -hmm. actually, you know, get out of their funk from, uh, you know, their, their little bit of their, uh, their adolescence and so forth, and they just become the best companions mm -hmm. uh, later on in life uh, uh, for you. They become your meaning in life uh, right. oftentimes, and you know they're a little eternity, that you've given rise right. and birth to something, uh, you know, that uh, somebody who will right. experience that Absolutely. eternity and that, that perfect, you know, love of God for all eternity, and you know, right. you know, there's just nothing wrong with that decision. Absolutely, absolutely. So I'm begging it's like, you. It's uh, like I used to think it was uh, right. Mm -hmm. It was like a little piece of your heart out there running around, you know, outside of you, and and that's how exactly. you feel about it. So with yeah. that being said, we got to yeah. take a break. We're running a little late. Much more ahead with uh, Father oops. Spitzer. More of your <laughs> questions. Stay with us. And welcome back to Father Spitzer's Universe. Just a reminder, Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent, and to be sure you have a fruitful season, you want to be sure to get your copy of Advent Reflections, Meditations for a Holy Advent, available naturally through the EWTN Religious Catalog, based on some fine talks done on EWTN over the years. And of course, our topic is vanity from Father's book, Christ vs. Satan in Our Daily Lives. And we return to Father Spitzer, and we were just talking a little bit over the break about how you'd go up and look up a, a famous adopted people and a yeah. couple of the ones that came across here, Babe Ruth, uh, Leo Tol Tolstoy, <laughs> Nelson Mandela, John Hancock, and then famous actors and yeah. actresses like Jack Nicholson, even uh, uh, Marilyn Monroe, yeah. So, uh, but a lot of famous yeah. people. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's just uh, amazing uh, how many people have been adopted. That, uh, you know, you can imagine if they grew up in this culture where, you know, easy abortion, ba-boom, right, you know. Right. There's, you know, a 50% you know, chance that uh, uh, they, they wouldn't have had any life at all. So, uh, you know, right. um, anyway, I didn't mean to belabor Absolutely. the point, but no, I wanted to definitely say, That's okay. get down to Obria and you know, get down to birthright or birth choice. Uh, yeah, there's and, a lot. Uh, you know, get some help. Probably in every city you can get in touch with some pro-life advocacy yeah. group or, or whatever. And there's obviously national ones who can put you in touch with uh, a local yeah. uh, group. Okay, so uh, here's another question. Uh, Dear mm -hmm. Father Spitzer, in discussing politicians and excommunication with several people, I think either I or they have a misunderstanding of as to what excommunication actually is. It's my understanding that an excommunicated person is not kicked out of the church. The purpose of excommunication is not to get rid of someone, but to encourage them to repent and come back in line with the teachings of the church. Am I correct? You are correct. That mm -hmm. is precisely it. Uh, to withdraw the possibility of going to communion, mm -hmm. uh, to allow the person to know they are out of communion with the church, uh, but not to kick them out, but to get them to repent. And that has right. been from the very first century onward, that has always been the intent. Very good. Uh, next up, uh, dear Father Spitzer, why do Catholics revere C.S. Lewis so much, even though he never converted to Catholicism? Is it because he was so intelligent and wrote such great books? How would we view a Catholic who leaves the Catholic Church and writes equally profound books as did C.S. Lewis? Of course, C.S. Lewis was never Catholic. So. Yeah, he was never Catholic uh, to begin with. And of course, if somebody left the Catholic Church, uh, then he might be writing books, mm -hmm. uh, but there's going to be something really deficient, uh, you know, if he's writing books about theology as C.S. Lewis did. Right. So, uh, you know, that was the, the main thing. But uh, C.S. Lewis did not really make a choice against the church per se. 
Uh, but I think the reason that people uh, like Lewis is his spiritual insight is deep. His mm. moral insight is deep. His apologetical insight is very deep. Uh, and he was a great apologist. He was a great Christian apologist. He was a great critic of culture. And of course, we could say that, you know, C.S. Lewis and Catholics mm. probably agreed on about 98% of things. Uh, I do know that C.S. Lewis in his own life felt a great deal uh, of pressure mm -hmm. uh, about, uh, you know, especially during the war, wanting to support his country, and of course, meaning supporting mm -hmm. uh, the, the royal family, which means supporting Anglicanism. Right. I think that was clearly on his mind. Uh, he had a lot of Catholic friends, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, and, uh, uh, you know, he was a high Anglican. He certainly, uh, you know, uh, had, uh, you know, a, a liturgy, right. a confession, many of the things that we have uh, as well. Uh, but that break um, that uh, with the Pope, of course, is a very, very important break, and it just can't be overlooked. Right. But you know, in his own way of uh, of you know looking at it, uh, he basically thought that uh, um, you know uh, it, it was doable for him mm -hmm. that it wasn't going to uh, influence him adversely. But his old friend G.K. Chesterton, I can tell you, uh, you know, tried. Uh, uh, to talk him uh, uh, into the Catholic Church, needless to say, and he Tolkien. had many friends at right. uh, Oxford. Tolkien. Uh, right. Tolkien made it a nonstop effort mm -hmm. uh, to bring him in uh, to the church, uh, for sure. And uh, uh, he had uh, many other, right. uh, you know, Catholic friends who certainly worked on him in the Inklings. Right. The Inklings, um, right? And yeah. of course, mm -hmm. and so there were, uh, you know, many. Uh, it's uh, many people who tried, right. but uh, yeah, I think, I think it, his pa mostly would, his patriotism right, would, in many ways. Right. He also, I think, he was from Northern Ireland, so there was a little bit of uh, a history, uh, you know, in dealing with yep. Catholics versus Protestants. And also, I would think yep. it'd be fair to say if you took him and his belief system today and plunked it into 2022, 2023, my guess is it would be much closer to what the Catholic Church continues to believe than what you find in many aspects of Anglicanism. Oh, yeah, I, mm -hmm. I mean, C.S. Lewis may well have been one of those huge numbers of Anglicans that have joined right. the Catholic Church yeah. in the last 15 years, absolutely. Part of the Roman option and, kind uh, of thing, right. Uh, yeah, the Roman option, exactly. Right. And so uh, uh, I would say that uh, that's probably uh, uh, a, a really good observation, Doug, it, it, because uh, I think he would have probably uh, been uh, ex extraordinarily close, if not Catholic, right. in today's world, well, because the, the Anglican Church has right. moved right. a lot, and his position would have been much more uh, closely identified with um, Catholic right. uh, position than um, with the um, Episcopalian right. Anglican position. You know, 20 today. years ago, we were over there we were doing some interviews for the Journey Home Show. And uh, a convert was Walter mm -hmm. Hooper, who had been uh, C.S. Lewis's secretary, and he became Catholic. Yeah. And I interviewed him about a, yeah. a book he wrote, and he, he was not allowed to say what his personal opinion about whether, because we asked him offline, well, would he have converted? He said, well, I really can't comment on it. I want it, you know, for the family, et cetera. So I asked him, I said, well, you became Catholic. What would he think of that? And he said he'd be very, very happy yeah. for me. So I thought that was kind of a, yeah, a, a, oh, kind wow. of a secondhand way of understanding where maybe Lewis would be. At least uh, that oh, was yeah. 20 years ago. So that yeah. was kind of interesting. So yeah, no, I'm sure he would have been happy for him. But, but, uh, yeah, but I think um, I, yeah, even today I think he might have moved right in the right, direction absolutely. of the Catholic Church. Oh, absolutely. To be honest, yeah, absolutely. One last question, yeah. maybe before we get to uh, the book. Uh, dear Father Spitzer, when receiving Holy Communion, I only receive the consecrated host and never the precious blood. My wife calls me a germaphobe and thinks I'm missing out on grace. I've explained that just because the chalice contains our Lord, it does not mean it, it can't be contaminated with someone's flu bug, and that I receive the whole body, blood, soul, and divinity under just the one species. Do I need to receive from the chalice? Ryan. Ryan, you do not need to receive from the chalice. Right. In fact, there are a lot of dioceses, including uh, the ones here in California, Southern California, where uh, you do not receive uh, from the chalice. And so um, uh, you don't have to receive from it because actually the body of Christ 
is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, the host you receive. Remember, Jesus in the right, he splits the right of the body from the right of the blood because he's trying to invoke the whole idea of a self-sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. Remember, a sin offering or a sin sacrifice mm -hmm. re required that you take the blood out of the uh, corpse um, of the, of the uh, sacrificial mm -hmm. animal, and then you, then you would burn the sacrificial uh, animal without the blood. Then you sprinkle the blood around an altar or a holy place for the purification mm -hmm. of the people. But that, the reason he did that is because he wanted um, to uh, definitely symbolize that this was being done uh, for the forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. So he has the double right. But uh, no, you do not have to receive from the chalice because the, the host itself has body, blood, soul, and divinity present within it. Right, very good. Let's move on to Satan ta Satan's tactics, uh, page 306. I'm talking about vanity, uh, you say it seems that the deadly sin of vanity has undermined everything of substance in our culture, threatening its future as well as individuals within it. We might even say that vanity is the preferred deadly sin within our culture and that Satan has done remarkably yeah. well in playing to this Achilles heel. Yeah, no, it's so true. I mean, um, I, you know, if you, I mean, Instagram itself. Uh, you know, I hate to keep picking on Instagram and Facebook, but the, the traditional media itself, I mean, it, it's all about vanity. I mean, just go into a store, go on any website and just look at, you know, it's not just the shopping options for practical things like, uh, you know, maybe food or, you know, uh, you know some, uh, you know, practical clothing or something of that nature. I mean, it's everything under the sun. I mean, to, to play to, uh, to, to vanity. I mean, car advertisements absolutely play uh, to vanity. In fact, they even use, you know, a, a kind of a, you know, a, 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 an underlying subconscious kind of symbolism mm -hmm. uh, to play uh, to vanity. I mean, this is all done uh, purposely. Uh, so that, you know, like subliminal seduction, if you ever read that book, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, it's to play to vanity, um, you know, they, to try and draw you in, even on the subconscious level, uh, to want something that you really don't need Goodbye. so that you might be viewed as better or more admirable than others. Mm -hmm. Everything is look at me and I'm better than you. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole idea of success of a life well lived, of the good life, and if you look at, you know, I'm better than you, is that's really what it's about? Right. Is that really right? You, that's what you're going to say at the end of the day? Right. Boy, what did I do at the end of my life? I'm now 95, and I'm looking back on my life, and I was better than all the rest of you inferiors. And uh, that's it? That's what you want to do? Make no contribution to anybody? Do nothing for anyone? Do nothing for our Lord? Mm -hmm. Do nothing for, you know, for uh, the church? Do nothing for the culture? You are just, be you belong to the Mensa Society, and you're just so, so <laughs> smart. That was it? That, uh, you know, of course, it's, you, you look at that and you go, oh my gosh. That is, you know, that, that'd be the, the, the kind of incipient, no, that'd be the total despair mm -hmm. of all time to have lived for that alone and to have all this knowledge, the Mensa Society, and have zero wisdom to know that in the end it means nothing right. if you didn't do anything for anyone, if you didn't pass it along, if you didn't make a difference to, to the kingdom of God or to the culture or to the church or to your family or to your friends or to your workplace. You did nothing, but you sure did act smug. Great. Right. That's a great purpose in life. Now, you know, the, the whole point, of course, is how do people get seduced into this kind of uh, craziness? Mm -hmm. Because the whole culture is screaming at them that this is what success is about. Right. The whole advertising establishment is you know you know basically barraging people with subliminal seduction toward vanity, and uh, 
you know, um, as uh, Al Pacino says in that movie, The Devil's Advocate, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, he's playing the devil, and at the end he, he fails at kind of getting this guy to do a horrible thing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this lawyer. But the lawyer comes out and he's feeling so proud of himself, and he thinks, wow, I'm great. And uh, Al Pacino's smiling, and he goes, <laughs> Vanity, mm. my favorite sin. Right. And uh, that's the end of the movie. So, I mean, the point is, uh, yeah, yeah, it's right. it's all all uh, over the place in the culture. So, um, yeah, we can barely escape from it. And right. Turn and, on your social media. Right. It's, it kind of reminds you of the Pharisees or the, the idea of the whitewashed sepulcher. Uh, the, those whole yeah. ideas of the, yeah. in a sense, of a person living a hollow life. Which is purely yeah, just yeah. you know uh, seen yeah. from the from the outside. Now you you talk about the, yeah. this idea that the longer we engage in these deadly sins, the more we want them, mm -hmm. and to satisfy our increased desire, we have to get more of them. Yeah, that's the problem, is that uh, vanity is is insatiable, right? Mm -hmm. So even if you get what you thought you wanted five years mm -hmm. ago, and now you've gotten everything, don't worry. By the time you've gotten it, you'll have a whole new set of goals that you have to get to. You'll have to have a larger house. You'll have to have better clothes. You'll have to <clears throat> have, uh, you know, more uh, companions that are worthy of you. You'll never belong to a club that'll have you as a member, et cetera, et cetera. Wow. So you, you're, you're always going to have, uh, you know, the higher option to reach for. And at the end of the day, you know, when you, you, when you die, you'll have been a very important and admired person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody's winking, you know, at the whole thing because they see there's no real substance there. Mm -hmm. It's all what the Italians call bella figura, right? You know, it's uh, all, all nice on the outside, ma dentro c'è niente, mm -hmm. you know, but inside there's nothing, you know. And so, uh, they, they, you know, the, you know the, the whole idea of, of the empty person empty of spiritual substance, mm -hmm. empty of moral substance, empty of the substance of ideals, empty of the substance of, of you know, con contribution and goodness to others, mm -hmm. empty of family, empty of real true friends, empty of empathy. I mean, oh, great. And finally, at the end of the day, empty of conscience, you know, and, and yet they look really good. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just got a bella figura. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. you know, it's not going to amount to a hill of beans, not to God. And really, I hate to say this, but not to you. At yeah. the end of the day, you will be most disappointed with your life if you lived for such emptiness. Right. And, and as you alluded to the idea that one can get something one wants to, to say that I'm better than you. Well, in order to continue yeah. to be better than you, one has to continue to add and differentiate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You can't, you, there's never any stopping it, right? right? Once you, you, you don't get to a plateau, I mean, you'll have to get to the next one because that's your purpose in life mm -hmm. is to be better than somebody. And there's always going to be people that look better, so you're going to have to get better. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you're just, uh, your old set of goals is just going to disappear, it'll vaporize, and you'll have to go for the next one, and there'll never be enough level two. There'll never be enough narcissistic uh, uh, objectives that can be met. There'll never be enough accolades that you can get. There'll never be enough perfection that you can live for. There'll never be a house that'll be perfectly satisfying. Right. There'll never be a car that'll be perfectly satisfying. There'll never be, you know, a, a, you know, a spitzer that will be perfectly satisfying. If that's what you're living for, as a uh, uh, you know, they say, mm -hmm. be prepared for disappointment because uh, right. that's what's coming down the pike. You got to go to God. You have to go to others. You have to go to contribution. You have to go to morality. You have to go to living for something of integrity, something that will, at the end of the day, have made a difference to someone or something beyond yourself. Right. Jumping that's the ahead. only way. Right. And jumping ahead from yeah. uh, out of vanity right into envy. Uh, and you talk about yeah. uh, another thing that fits very well into yeah. this culture. Envy is a resentment towards another person yep. who appears to have an advantage or some benefit that one does not have. Why is it yeah. such a yeah, the terrible thing? Yeah, you want to talk about that? Go ahead. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, the jealousy versus the envy. Right, I mean, exactly. I yeah. mean, I could be jealous of somebody, but I don't want to harm the person who has what I don't have, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but with envy, it's not the fact that I'm jealous that you have something, you know, because my focus is on the thing you have that I don't have. Mm -hmm. In envy, the focus is on the person who has mm -hmm. what I don't have, and now my envy is, I hate you because you have this thing that I don't have. And how am I going to handle this? I'm going to have to do you some harm. So the fact that the hatred is there for the person who has the comparative advantage mm -hmm. always generally leads to some harm. They're going to harm the reputation of the person. They're going to harm the, the welfare of the mm -hmm. person. They'll harm the public image of the person, right? They'll under, you know, gossip, you know, things of that nature. They're going to do as much as they can to harm this person they, they disregard. And the reason I picked Iago uh, from mm -hmm. Shakespeare's uh, play Othello right. was because He's the most envious guy uh, right. that has been created in literature. Right. I mean, he, he's uh, such a horrible person that because, you know, o Othello gives a promotion to uh, a lieutenant other than him, he is so envious of that lieutenant, but he just can't get rid of, uh, you know, the lieutenant. He's got to get rid of Othello's Othello. He's got to uh, cudgel Othello's wife. He's right. got to, you know, and he, he basically causes either the irreparable harm or the death of about eight people because he's envious. Mm -hmm. And you look at that and you go, wow, <coughs> can envy really be that powerful? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Envy can be that powerful. The hatred that is generated from envy just knows no bounds. And that's why so many of the classical writers, right, Milton and mm -hmm. Spencer and so forth, oh, they write about envy the, with terrible, terrible metaphors, things of that nature, because it really, right. really, it's such a destructive, destructive deadly sin. And people, oh, it's all in your mind. It's never in your mind, all in your mind. Oh yeah, there's, it starts in your mind. You know, I hate this guy because he's got this set of talents that I don't have. I hate this guy because, you know, he's got this kind of energy that I don't have. I hate this guy because he has these possessions that I don't mm. have, right? I mean, the, the, the fact is, is when the minute you say you hate somebody because you think you were dealt to, it's, you're always going to get a raw deal, right? That's right, why you hate the right, guy. Right. You just think, hey, I got Unfairness, a bad hand. I got yeah. a, raw, a raw deal. Unfairness. Right. Yeah, and so, uh, you know, what, what do you do about that? Well, you hate the guy, and then you get even with him by undermining him in some way, make him look bad, etc. It's it's just a terrible, terrible thing, and so um, yeah, it knows right. no bounds. You can actually go to or beyond the limits, you know, of even uh, not even murdering him, but in Shakespeare's case, right, right mur murdering uh, the guy and then speaking ill about him after you've done him in. Right. So you know, just uh, you know, the gift that keeps on giving. Right. Now, I thought it was interesting, we only got about two minutes, but you talk about that jealousy involves mm -hmm. three people, and envy, on the hand, other hand, mm -hmm. is restricted to, the, to two people. How so? Well, because, of course, you know, with, with jealousy, uh, you know, you would, uh, uh, you would not, not only like to, it, 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 it has really three objectives, mm -hmm. right? You want the object that the other person has. And, and so, in a way, uh, you are, uh, you know, if it's a, an, a person that they have mm -hmm. that you want and you covet that person, of course, that's a, uh, you know, a, a different matter. But really, with envy, you know, it's, you don't care whether you get the object at the end of the day. It matters more that you pay back the person who got mm -hmm. what you didn't get. And that's why it's just like a direct controversion of the... Uh, of um, the well-being of the mm -hmm. person rather than I want to swipe this object, I want to get this object, I want to cheat to get this object, whatever the case may be. And of course if that's a, a third person, then of course the third person is involved. But with the, if you have a third person uh, with respect to envy, mm -hmm. uh, you, don't, you don't care that he's got a nice wife you don't have. You, you skip you know, wanting to get that wife and bring her into your purview. I just want to harm that guy right. uh, who's got the wife that I don't have. <laughs> right. you know? So you really don't co-involve her, you know, et cetera. 
Right. It's, it's like with people being uh, upset like that in a situation and saying to somebody, well, would you really want that? Well, not really, but I just don't want them to have it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, I can't, you know, can't stand the guy. It's a, right. You know, it's unfair. And, uh, and uh, you know, the idea is, you know, he's inferior to me anyway. Right. Why should he have right. uh, a whatever uh, like this, a wife like this, a right. house like this, a car like this, whatever? Right, absolutely. Yeah. With that said, perfect timing, Father. You hit us right on the nose. So if you'd like to <laughs> give us your blessing Very on the good. way out the door, that'd be great. Absolutely. And may Almighty God send His Holy Spirit of wisdom down upon you and once again give you that sense of Himself, that sense of His heart, that sense of why all of these deadly sins are so uh, undermining of His will and His love, a sense of orienting yourself toward the virtue that will protect you and helping others to get to that virtue for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of themselves, and for the sake of the culture in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Spitzer. Have a great Thanksgiving, and we shall see you next week. And don't forget, everybody, Father Spitzer's books and DVDs are always available through our EW10 Religious Catalog. Next week, we'll take a look as we continue on Envy and EW10's bookmark. Gee, what a surprise. It's the moral wisdom of the Catholic Church with the one and only Father Robert Spitzer that we taped at the family celebration. So hopefully you'll enjoy that this weekend. Advent Reflections are beginning Sunday, November 27th, as you see on your screen, starting at 11.30 p.m. and then Wednesdays at 11.30 a.m. So we'll have reflections each week throughout Advent. Stay with us for all of our programming as we move towards Christmas. But don't forget Advent. I'm Doug Keck. We'll see you next time on Father Spitzer's Universe. Thanks.